Uh, my name is DJ Lamarty. Um, very happy to be here. Uh, sorry I wasn't here to uh, to enjoy John's presentation this morning. I just came up from Santa Barbara, and my seat heater got stuck on, so I just drove for three hours, kind of hovering above my seat in my car. It was not too impressive. Um, but anyway, I just want to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, again, my name is DJ Lamarty. I um, I'm the general manager of Sam Piper Golf Club in Rancho San Marcos in Santa Barbara. Um, I'm originally from Chicago. Um, I moved to Santa Barbara when I was 18 years old and started working at Sandpiper. Um, and I've been there ever since. I've been there 14 years um, and had a lot of great opportunities with the company. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Uh, growing up, I grew up in a, in a golfing family. My father played a lot of golf. He started me playing when I was three years old at the plastic clubs, the whole deal. Uh, Caddy grew up in Chicago and really enjoyed the golf business, enjoyed business and was always interested in kind of a leadership role. Uh, my father was a city manager in Chicago for 30 years, and so um, I, would, I spent a lot of time at city council meetings, uh, things of that nature, so I was always kind of interested in kind of a, a lead role um, in some type of business or golf. So that's kind of why I moved out to Santa Barbara. Um, that's why I chose kind of the profession that, that we're all in, and so it's been pretty exciting to be able to have the opportunities that I've had in, in Santa Barbara. Um, so, for those of you out there, how many people manage individuals at their properties? How many manage more than five? How many manage more than 10? More than 20? More than 30? <laughs> more than 40? More than 50? All right, there's a few out there. So, it looks like most people manage people. So, we know that choosing to lead people is pretty insane. Can we all agree? I mean, it's, it's fairly challenging. We're dealing with a lot of different personalities. We're dealing, dealing with a lot of different uh, challenges on a day-to-day -day basis. We're trying to take our team and, and, and mesh it together for, for a common purpose. So that's kind of where I got interested because I, I found it very interesting through learning and uh, my trials and tribulations when I started managing people um, as a, a general manager and head golf professional at 24 years old, I realized that I didn't have a very good skill set to do what I was doing. Um, it was very stressful, it took a lot of hours, things that I was trying weren't working. Um, I didn't understand why, so I started to look to my father who managed you know, a city to kind of better understand the psychology of what goes on in my personal mind uh, to have better self-awareness so I could be a better leader and help people along. Kind of the way that I've always looked at it is um, I'm not necessarily leading people or uh, letting people lead me for the benefit of the business. I'm looking at it to lead people to better lives. And when I find good people and we work together, we all have a better life. Okay? Because we're doing a job um, that creates income, but if we do it well together and we can all work together as a team, you know, everybody's going to benefit. So that's kind of the way I look at it. Okay? So, um, again, introduction, this is the agenda we'll talk about today, the power of planning, time and how we'll use it, leadership and the new order of things, uh, managing conflict, and then uh, a little bit of a conclusion with a few, a few slides that I find interesting. Um, this is an interesting uh, quote, it was from my grandfather. Um, my grandfather was uh, from Italy. Um, and very, very old school. Never was, never was on a plane before, didn't trust anything other than a passbook savings account, uh, worked on the railroad, was in, was in the Army when he came over to the United States, and was very, very old school. Um, and he had to do things like, he had to lie about his age when he was a kid uh, living in Chicago so he could work to provide for his family. So when he was getting older, um, he kind of phrased this to us, um, to, to my sister and I, and uh, instilled in my father as well, because a lot of his decisions in life were made up for him, okay? He didn't, uh, the depression was going on, there was a lot of different uh, variables that led him to uh, make certain decisions, had to do certain things. So he always asked us, what are you gonna do? It's a limited time. Um, so again, going back to the decision to, to be in this industry, in this career, um, you know, I, I looked at it and I said, what do I wanna do with the time? I love golf. I love people, and I love putting a smile on people's faces with the guests. Um, and so he just said, be, be, be very cognizant of time, because it goes by very fast. You know, he died at 94 years old, but again, his decisions were limited. So he said, make your decisions, think about your decisions, just realize that time is something 
you know, you only have so much of it, so, so what are you going to kind of do with it? So I thought that was interesting. Um, the first thing is the power of planning. Um, the reason I put this up there, it's one of my favorite quotes. And um, all of us at the golf courses in Santa Barbara, we plan to death. Uh, the assistant golf professionals hate it at sometimes because we plan, we plan, and we plan, and we plan some more. Uh, because again, we feel like we, we want to be perfect in everything we do, and if we strive for perfection, we attain excellence. So that's the, the quote from Vince Lombardi. It's one of the things we always do. And we found, and I've found personally, that if you don't plan, you're gonna miss something and you're gonna make a mistake, okay? So I really feel, um, and we really feel the same way for leadership. If you don't plan for it, if we don't think about it, if we don't try and learn more about it, um, and we don't have a plan on how we're gonna lead our teams and how we're gonna make them better, um, it's not gonna work. Um, and it's gonna have a lot more bumps in the road. So I find this quote, I have a big framed picture of, of Abe in my office, um, and uh, I just find this quote great because I've, we've found that the more planning we do, the more preparation we do, whether it's a tournament or you know, a wedding or a meeting or whatever we're trying to do, the planning has, has been very important. So this kind of seminar and, and some of these ideas are just things that I've learned um, through reading books and through watching my, my father and some of the psychologists that he worked with in his career to develop these. So I wanted to share some of these, but all this that you're going to see is part of some of the planning that we've done uh, with our team in Santa Barbara to, to be a better leadership team. All right. So the first thing that, uh, kind of the first thing that I want to touch on is the decade of the denial. Okay. And that has been the last 10 years. Um, being in Santa Barbara, um, coming from Chicago, going to Santa Barbara, and um, I basically took the leadership role right before the economy crashed. So in Santa Barbara, things were great. We had tournament rounds going. It was going gangbusters. Mike used to work with us there in Santa Barbara. The place was just insanely busy, Santa Barbara being a destination, and then it fell off the cliff. And uh, for a long time, um, after that, I think people thought that things were going to be back the way they were for a while. Um, and that's where the decade of denial comes in. You know, I don't think the golf industry is ever going to be the same. I think, obviously, we were overextended. Um, there was uh, some greed going on uh, with a lot of the development and things like that. And uh, we were kind of in denial that that was going to last forever. Um, and I think we've all proven that uh, things aren't going to be the same and we're going to have to change. We used, when Mike worked there, we had 80 employees. Now we have 36 employees, and we have a lot more jobs to do. The social media, the golf now, the, all these different things. So we've been shrunken down to a very small team, but uh, required to do a lot more. And I don't see us ever being at 80, 80, 80 people for, for the team ever again. Uh, moments of disruptive change, again, that goes back to uh, what I mentioned before. You know, It can be very disruptive when you have to lean down on your team. Um, when you have to change operations, um, when you have to let people go, or you have to really manage people with a different leadership style because you need more results and you need it quicker. We don't have time to let people skate through their positions. We have to get things done and we need execution. So a lot of those things, the moments of disruptive change, they're hard. And when you're the leader of the organization, you're taking those on the chin because you have to be able to steer the ship through those challenging times um, and uh, be able to handle that both emotionally and physically at times. Uh, how many hours we have to work sometimes as, as golf professionals. But the, those moments of disruptive change are, are something that we have to deal with as the, as the leaders of the operations. Uh, again, the rendezvous with reality. Uh, I think that's kind of where we're at now or we're continuing to get at. It's where we're accepting where we are today. This is what it is. This is what the golf industry is. This is what our role is. I used to do this in my job, and now I do this, 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 and this. Well, we have a choice. We can either take it and say, this is what I do, and I'm appreciative, and this and that, or there's some other you know, friends that I know that are in this industry, and they hate it. Okay, They can't stand their job, and they hate it, they don't like the change. Well, as we talked about before, it's not going away. This is the way it is now, and we have to accept it, and I think that uh, uh, a lot of the information that John present, uh, presented and getting together as a group and really banding together as golf professionals, that's going to allow us to be more efficient, um, to be smarter, and to be able to handle those additional duties and not get to the point where the job feels like it's unbearable. 
Um, that being said, with all the different changes, we're living in exponential times. So uh, one of the facts that's in, uh, that I thought interesting, in 1970s, a uh, supercomputer was $31 million. Now you can get an iPad for $4.99 that has the exact same amount of power. Okay? Uh, so here's some interesting facts about what goes on in today's different world. The number of text messages sent and received every day exceeds the total population of the planet. The average American teen teenager sends a uh, received 75 text messages per day. One girl in Sacramento, California, managed to handle an average of 10,000 texts every 24 hours for a month. At the end of the Super Bowl, traffic reached 12,233 tweets per second. That one was shocking to me. YouTube has 4 billion views per day within 48 hours, uh, with 48 hours uploaded every minute. Okay? That's a lot of data. One third of adults age 18 to 24 use social networks even while going to the bathroom. Okay. That didn't happen 10, 12 years ago. Okay. In 2013, there were over 68,541 searches performed on Google every second. Okay. So just do a little math on you know how long I've been standing up here and how many Google searches have happened. I search a lot of Google. Okay. Part of that being efficient and learning things new. I don't know the answer. I Google, and it's a pretty amazing thing. But the amount of information that's being transferred is crazy. 2000, uh, in 2000, it was 694. So you can see the increase um, in just short 14 years, how much we are reaching for data in the world today. Here's some more statistics on Google. I um, hope everyone can see this stuff and stand right in front of it. Uh, 1998, when Google first started, it was uh, 3,600,000 searches. Um, average searches per day, you can see. And you can see how the numbers go up. Okay. That's just, again, that shows me when I look at these, how much people are reaching for information, but more importantly, how much information is at our fingertips, and how much inf information is at everybody's fingertips. Like, for example, the 19-year-old guest service associate that wants to argue with me about uh, HR law, and how he doesn't have to take his 30-minute lunch period because of some lawsuit in Maine. And, how he can do this and prints out forms and brings them in and tells me if he signs this, he doesn't have to work X, Y, Z. So those things happen, and again, we have to have the ammunition to be able to handle that type of information flow. Uh, oh, here we go. It's estimated that four exabytes of unique information is generated worldwide every year. That's four million terabytes or 4 billion, 96 million gigabytes, okay? So that's a lot of external hard drives. Uh, and that's, that's just a ton of information, okay? Ask by is 4 billion terabytes. So all that information that's generated now is more than in the previous 5,000 years. So that really puts into perspective, again, the foot on the accelerator for all this information, all this data. Radio took 38 years to reach 50 million people, TV 13 years, the internet four years, iPod three years, and Facebook two years. Okay? There's other also a fact. Uh, Facebook, and this, this is dated back to uh, last year when I did this, so I'm sure it's higher, but Facebook had 950 million people. So that's rivaling China, India, and the Catholic Church on Facebook. Okay? That, that's, I mean, that's a serious number. Okay, so that's, that's just a ton of people connecting online. Number of internet devices in 1984 was 1,000, 1992, 1 million, in 2008, 1 billion, and the average American spends at least eight and a half hours per day in front of a screen. How many of you spend eight and a half hours a day in front of a screen? Okay, me too. Never thought I would, but I do now. I've got three screens. I've got two on one computer and then my laptop going and my phone and the earpiece and the whole deal. And I usually sit in there. I try to take breaks, but it's a different world. So much data coming in, so many websites to manage, so much HR things to do. We don't have accounting on site. We don't have HR on site. So again, those, those hours spent in front of that computer are a lot different than what I thought it would be when I was a caddy looking at the head golf professional teeing it up four or five days a week. <laughs> 
Um, so as leaders, um, you know, we're preparing, I truly believe we're, we're currently preparing PGA future leaders for jobs that are far different and may not yet exist using technologies that haven't been invented. Okay? Um, a lot of the stuff that John talked about, the golf now, uh, the dynamic pricing, uh, the Facebook, all these things, I mean, 10 years ago, we wouldn't have even dreamed that we were dealing with this stuff in the golf business. We wouldn't even think that we had to worry about diverting people's attention from this third-party website to our website. We weren't even talking about online tee times at that point. It was a call in, you want to play golf, you play this golf course, you call us, you come, you book a tee time, you go. You also, if you have a problem, you would probably go into the golf shop and you would tell somebody about that problem so we could help you. Now, they'll just, oh yeah, everything's great. Then they're going to go on their phone, on Yelp, and just destroy you. And have it just smiled at you. And then you have to go on your computer for eight and a half hours and find that. And they have to backpedal it and chase them down so you can apologize and then give them some free golf. Okay? It used to be a lot simpler. But that's just not the way it is anymore. So I don't know what the technology is going to be in the future. But I know that I'm pretty technologically savvy with this stuff. And I'm having a hard time keeping up. So I can't imagine what these guys in the future are going to have to keep up with. Okay? A modern view of anxiety is that caused by too much stimuli, so much that the brain cannot get its conceptual arms around them. This is from David Morrison. This is uh, the group that my father worked with. Um, as, he can, as he was managing the city, he started to see the change in society. Um, and he ended up retiring early because he thought society was going crazy. Okay? People's expectations of um, what they're supposed to get. What do I get? started to change at such a rapid pace that they were, they were having a hard time keeping up. And when you have a city full of people and you have uh, a lady on you know, 123 4th Street calling the police 911 because there's deer eating her roses and she wants them to come shoot them because she thinks that her roses are the most important thing. Okay? You've got to come get them. So as these things started changing, uh, my father and another group of uh, executives in Chicago, a few CEOs, they started this group and they work with Dr. David Morrison and they're talking about things like this. They're starting to digest, uh, they're starting to digest the information, they're starting to pull apart the, the, the thinking of the residents, of our guests, of our customers, and of our employees to understand why things are the way they are. But I th find this very interesting because especially for employees I feel this, when there's a lot of information flux or too much information in front of them, they get paralyzed. They have a hard time making decisions, and they have a hard time doing what they need to do, which is take care of the people in front of them. You know? um, I don't know how many times, who's been into like a Verizon or AT&T store for their phone? Can anybody tell me what's the first thing you see when you walk in? Somebody walks up to you and you checks you in. And that's great. I wish it was. I wish it was, but in Santa Barbara, whenever I go in, this is what I see. This is the counter. I see this. I walk in the door, ding, and I see this. And I continue to see this. I'm like, hey, how you doing? Like, oh, thank you. you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm interrupting them, you know. So, um, so I find it very interesting that, um, you know, there's so much information flux. Some people don't know, know when and how to turn it off. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, that, that idea of too much stimuli, I think that it applies to everybody. It applies to us as the leaders, it applies to the customers, it applies to the residents, it applies to the members, and it definitely applies to the staff. Uh, next one is we're living in a world that's constantly tantalizing the reward centers of our brain. Short bursts of dopamine that come from things like email make it hard to focus on long-term goals. Uh, this was from a Stanford professor. Um, who has that problem in this room? Phone constantly ringing, buzzing, beeping. Yeah. But, well, that's a challenge that, again, as leaders, we have to deal with. Um, and we have to train our assistants and our staff how to deal with it. Because me, personally, I work probably about 200 emails a day is, is about what I'm at right now, which is crazy. So, you know, for a while I was trying to chase the emails, um, but then other things start to lack. Um, and what we've decided on, we're, gonna, we're going to focus on the blocking and tackling, and that's the main parts of our business, which is taking care of the people in front of us, making sure we have a good product, 
that we're proud to sell, and making sure that we're, ta again, taking care of the people in front of us. So, Mr. Smith, when you're there, you're the most important person. Emails, they can pile up, just like the golf carts in the staging area or in the landing area. I don't want you in the back washing the golf cart right now because we have guests on the golf course. When all the guests are gone, then you can wash the golf carts, but not before. I know you have a party tonight with your friends at Isla Vista, but we have to make sure we take care of the people in front of us first, and then we'll deal with the rest. So I think that, that stimuli comes from a lot of different ways. It comes from issues with employees, it comes from email, it comes from all these different areas, from guests, from problems, um, challenges. But as the leaders, we're the ones that have to sift through all that. We have to figure out what's the most important thing that we have to focus on, and then we have to point the team in that direction. Okay. So, as the leaders, kind of going back to digesting all that data and information that I gave you about everything that's coming in, um, I found it very interesting, and we talk about it all the time at the golf courses, why are we here? So who inspires us? Um, for a number of years, this year, uh, last year, were, were two years that I didn't do it, but for the six years prior, we did a, a leadership, a PGA leadership program at, in Santa Barbara. So we had between two and seven apprentices from PGM programs, and we brought them in. We did an extensive uh, program where we uh, interviewed them, we did phone interviews, we did Skype interviews, and then we forced them to fly out on their own, on their own dime, and interview in person as a group, and we ran them through a bunch of different things, and then we chose, depending on how many slots we have, people to come work with us for the summer. And so during those, um, one of the questions that we asked is, what do you want to do? Why are you here? And they all originally said they wanted to be a director of golf, a head professional, a CEO, run a company, a general manager, all those things, which is great. And I said, well, why do you want to do that? 80% of them did not know why. They did not know. And I can tell you that we talk about it a lot um, with our leadership team at the golf courses because if we don't know why we're doing it, it makes it very hard for us to push on. It makes it very hard to get out of bed. And when you have those challenges, if you forget why you're doing it, it's really hard to do. It becomes a chore. So I always force them to write an essay about why they're doing this. Why do you want to be a general manager? Because it's on the top of the totem pole, or technically it you know, could be the highest salary. If that's the reason you're doing it, I think we can all agree it's a bad reason. Okay? Because if, if you're doing it for money or if you're doing it for you know, the, the title, that's just not a good reason. So each individual, I think, has their own reason why they do things. But uh, to us, we find it very important to understand who inspires us and why we're doing things. So Abe Lincoln's up there uh, because that's one of, my, one of my personal people that inspires me. Then who do you inspire? You know, uh, talking about that leadership program, the, uh, the assistants, a uh, couple of the assistants that work at Sandpiper uh, currently that, that, that are still there, they were PGM students so that when we have the apprentices come in, they kind of get to spend a lot of time with them. Um, and they're so close in age that they relate to them real well. So they can talk about the Facebook and all those different things and, and they play golf together and do those things. And I, see, I think they've seen how much they can make a difference in the other associates. And we talk about that a lot as well. How much time you know, do we spend with our guests or with our associates? We struggle with that all the time because we have, again, 80, 80 associates down to 36 right now. 80 to 36, there's less time, there's less bodies, but the same or more amount of tasks. So how do we do the blocking, tackling? How do we make sure that every single day we're touching all the part-time associates? Letting them know how important they are to the organization. Letting the guests know how much we appreciate them being there. How are we gonna do that on a daily basis consistently? Um, because again, we inspire them. And like John's programs that he talked about, um, and I'm sure the programs that the PGA are doing or that you all are doing, we inspire people to play golf, we inspire people to come see us at the golf courses or take instruction, and if we don't inspire them, we're gonna have a problem. Um, if we don't inspire our associates to exceed their own personal expectations and strive for perfection, we're gonna have a problem. So as the leaders, that's something that, uh, that we <coughs> must do. Um, because uh, that's part of our responsibility. You can't really see, but on the, on the top there, it says the sweet spot. So this is kind of a little diagram that I put together. Um, and it kind of talks about the relationship between the guest experience and operations. 
okay? Um, one thing, has anybody ever been anywhere where um, you're the customer and an associate or an employee of that business or restaurant or whatever has given you too much information about their internal problems that's affected your experience? Anybody had that before? You know, oh, we're short staffed or we're this or I'm new or all those things. Well, I think we can all agree that at least the guests, have, they don't care. The customers don't care, okay? They paid $180 to play Sam Piper and they're really not concerned with the internal workings of our operation. They want what they paid for. And I agree with them. They should get what they paid for. And this relationship is interesting because the top part is operations, okay? We're the professionals. It's our profession. Our job is to create the experience. It's not their job to ask for the experience. We're here to create it. Okay? We're supposed to be the experts. Okay? So we should know what they want before they know it. And we should be able to give it to them before they ask for it. Because we're the experts. Okay? We're PGA Golf professionals. Um, what we know, we know a lot more. We have the data. We have the, the insight. We know what's the new hot club or the new club fitting uh, technique or the new teaching technique. We have all that information. Data and experience. Power and knowledge. Those are all the things we have to run the operation. Okay? In my opinion, they don't need to know any of that. They don't need to know that we have those tools. Um, they just need to understand what we show them, which is the guest experience. Um, back to what the guests have here at the voluntary exchange. So they voluntarily give us money, and they don't have to do it. So like John's uh, example earlier in regards to the discounting issues, one golf course goes from 36 to 32. They have issues, or they have options on where to play. Um, and it's a voluntary exchange. So if we don't provide them with the guest experience that they expect or that they want, you know, for example, Sam Piper, they live in Chicago, where I'm headed this afternoon, and it's 20 below zero, and they're looking at the website, and Sam Piper and Sunny, and looking at the weather, oh my God, and they're building this dream in their mind, and they're willing to give me the money based on the dream they have in their mind, but when they get there, if it doesn't match up, we're going to have a problem, okay? Because they're going to tell all their friends all the stories because they built it up and they got there and the guest service guy was sleeping at the podium or the greens were airified and we didn't tell them or whatever it was. And then all these stories that they have are going to be negative and then we're going to have a problem. Again, we're going to have the Yelps and the Travelocity and we're going to have all these different, <coughs> these different reviews that we're going to have to battle all because we weren't paying attention to the guest experience. Um, on the positive side, um, we can look at what, what we hear from the guests. So not only what we hear from them and, and their body language and, and, and what the feedback is, that's one thing we ask every day. We do what's called a real-time update at Sandpiper and Andrew San Marcos. So every day about 5.30, 6 o'clock, I get an email, and it has four areas. And one of them, it's an update from the facility. And whoever's the manager on duty or golf professional sends that out. And we listen to all the feedback that's coming that day. And we tell the guest service team specific things to say, not, hey, how are you? Or how was it out there, the normal? We ask targeted questions, and we'll really think about it as a management team and think about what are we going to ask this month, and why are we asking this question, or what feedback are we trying to get? You know, if we slow down the greens slightly, we'll, we'll, every, every question will be targeted about the greens. And I'm not going to say, were the greens too slow today? We slowed them down. We're going to ask questions about it to get the feedback. What did that make it more fun? For those of you who have played Sandpiper, the greens can be murderous, okay? They can be so fast that it makes it not fun. And the 18th green is sloped back to front like this. It was built in 1972. So when they're running about 12, it's impossible, okay? You can five, six putt like that. So we try and make it happen fun, but again, going back to that feedback, with that real-time update, we're trying to hear what we hear from the guests, okay? what's going on, and how do we gauge it versus the guest experience. Symbols as well. Um, symbols can be many different things. Again, body language. Um, do they come into the golf shop after and buy something? Okay. I don't know many upset people that hated the golf course and hate all of us and come into the golf shop and buy a shirt. Okay. Normally when they come in after the round um, and buy something, it's because they enjoyed their day thus far. So we track that and we kind of talk about that a little bit. Same thing with food and beverage. If they can't come in after the round and uh, we prompt them to come visit us in the grill and they're sitting there and they stay till it's pitch black, they had a great day and they're still having a great day. You know, sometimes too much and we have to give them a cap. <laughs> but, um, but again, those are symbols that we're looking for, okay? 
Um, these are some of the things that we're looking for. Um, identify value conflicts. So again, understanding what their expectations are and what we do in the operation. You know, whether we give out towels. You know, I did a big comp survey recently because we give out towels with every guest that plays the golf course, put in the cubby. Um, give out personalized waters, you know, logo waters. Did a big comp survey. So what are other competitors or people in our landscape or in Southern California, what are they doing? Um, what are the guests experience like at the other places? And what are we doing operationally? Uh, depersonalized issues. So, you know, that, that's, that's, a big, that's a big thing. Um, when people have an issue at the golf course or they start uh, complaining about something, trying to depersonalize it, you know, make sure it doesn't become DJ versus Mr. Smith or Sandpiper versus Mr. Smith. Make sure we take it down a notch. Um, find out what in the experience we did not provide that they're so upset about or happy about, and then depersonalize it. Uh, make sure it doesn't go on that personal level. Generalize it and improve it if we can. Uh, understanding logic differences—that's an interesting one. Um, you know, people's expectations. Uh, I think again in today's world are a lot different than they used to be. They expect a lot more for their money. Uh, can everyone agree with me there? You know, they want to pay twenty dollars and pl and have perfect greens. They want to have the cheapest prices or the, the discount on the clubs or the lesson, but they want the best instruction. So we have to understand their logic is just different. So how we deal with that logic and how we understand their logic and how we manipulate that logic um, is going to be the difference between, again, meeting our expectation and uh, not uh, using our operations. Um, focusing on structure, um, you know, we talked about that as What's the structure of how we deal with guest feedback and the experience? So we structure those things, meaning that if we have an issue, what are the internal things we do? And that doesn't mean telling Johnny, the guest service guy, that he has to go find a manager. We tell him in advance, if this happens, you do this. If they say this, you do that. And they have the power to make the decisions. So we kind of structure that in advance um, just to make sure that there's no waiting, okay? Because I don't like it when I go places. Um, the leadership team, we've all agreed that when we go somewhere and someone has to go find a manager or has to go do that, it just makes the problem worse. Because if they have to stand there for another 10 minutes and stew, it's just not good for anybody. So um, we kind of focus on, on the structure of how we handle those things. And again, kind of similar to depersonalize is no victims or villains, okay? Nobody's right or wrong, it is what it is. Um, I don't, you know, if someone has an opinion and they think, Sandpiper sucks, that's fine. I can appreciate their opinion. I will get as much feedback as I can. Um, I might not agree, but again, they don't care about my opinion. They care about their expectations. So getting that information, doing as much as we can for them, uh, making sure that the staff doesn't panic, you know, because they work so hard and when someone comes in and says they had a bad time, that's very stressful for people, especially young guys that have been working you know, 13, 14 hours a day, and then someone comes in and tears them a new one, you know, it's hard for them to handle. Um, so make sure that, again, when we see that, we tell not only the guests, hey, we try and smooth it over with them, but we make sure that the associates don't feel like they're the, the villains, like they did something wrong. Uh, because in most cases, they didn't. It's either miscommunication or it's someone that has a logic difference that is just not going to be met, irregardless of how much we broke the subject. So. We offer them to come back um, for another round of golf or refund their money, shake hands, and, and part ways. And if they come back, we'll, we'll, we'll show them a great experience. If they decide not to, you know, so you can't win them all. You know, we, we hate it, but, but we sometimes you just can't fight it. Okay? So I just thought it was interesting. Again, um, this was kind of spurred along by you know, when, when I go into a place or when our leadership team goes into a place and people give us too much information. They talk about way too much of this, and they forget that I came to that Apple store to get my iPhone. I'm not really interested about your text messages with a friend. I just want to get in and get my charger and get out. I don't need to know the inner workings of what's going on at the Apple store. Okay. Um, so that being said, um, everything is a culmination. Um, you know, leadership is uh, 
again, about dealing with people earlier, earlier before, I, I mentioned how difficult I think it is to manage people. Um, a few friends of mine are uh, executives and CEOs, and we talk about it all the time. We say, we are nuts. Why did we choose this? Leading people is so difficult sometimes, yet so rewarding. I love it, but it's crazy. So how do we better deal with it? And this is one of the things that we talk about with this little group of guys that we have. It's kind of the innate effects. So basically emotions, okay? Positive, okay? Interest and excitement, enjoyment and joy. That I put on the top because that's what we're trying to achieve. We're trying to get positivity out of our ownership, our managers, if we have people managing us, um, our guests, our employees, our family. We're trying to create this. Everybody wants this. In my opinion, I hope. I do. Uh, positivity, okay? Neutral is surprise or startle. It's kind of neither here nor there because it can go either way. And then it's the negative, okay? Now, in my personal opinion, I don't read the paper very often. I don't watch the news um, because it's too much of this. This is what our world, society, again, anybody, I challenge anybody to debate after. This is what we like for some reason. It's negative, okay? That's, you open a paper, you read about this. Um, there's, there's not enough positivity, okay? So understanding these innate effects and how they affect people, um, guests, employees, all those different things, I just find interesting. Um, and I find it worthy to think about and talk about because all these negatives down here can all be triggered by our behavior. Contempt, disgust, probably all of those in one if you do that, okay? Um, that's not so good. You know, I, I've done, I did that before when I, was, when I was young because I was so passionate about doing a good job, I was very reactive. So it was like problem solving. You know, I have to get the thing so fast. I have to fix that situation. Oh, that picker's broken, the mechanic's busy, I'll do it myself. Reacting all the time. You know, and not taking time to understand what this is and also realizing this is what it's all about. If people enjoy their workplace, they're going to work harder. If they are interested in what's going on, you involve them in the decisions, you tell them why we're doing things, they're going to do more. Okay? And this was, for me personally, it was a big learning lesson. And until I started to understand this, I was banging my head up against the wall. Why aren't they doing this? Why aren't they meeting deadlines? Why aren't these done at this way? You know, I'm 25 years old, I just didn't have the skill set to understand that my approach was wrong. It just was wrong. And when I would talk to my father about it and say, hey, you know, why are they doing this? Da, 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 da. He would say, you know, slow down. You know, what are you doing? <laughs> what, it's not what they're doing. You're the one that's supposed to be guiding them in the right direction. If you're not getting the intended result that you require or you would like, then you need to change your approach. And that's when I started really thinking about this. And I look at this all the time. How does my behavior as the leader of the operation control this? Okay. And... I find it very, very fun and exciting. Whenever I see anything like this, a guest walks in flipping out, I pop out of my office no matter what I'm doing because I look at that as an opportunity for a win. What's wrong with them? Diagnose the situation, listen to what they're talking about, communicate with them on an even level, fix it, and watch them walk away happy. And I can't tell you how many people still to this day call me, text me, or email me personally to book their tea times just because of an interaction we had when they were having a complete meltdown. And all I did was come out there and let them vent, listen, and then try and provide them with a very level-headed answer. In the earlier days, there were a couple times where there were some people that were drinking too much at the golf course, and they, you know made some unwarranted comments to the staff and I took it personally and puffed my chest out and you know, I was like, come on, let's go. <laughs> you want to yell? Let's yell. Um, and I found that that didn't work very well. Okay? They didn't come back, the rest of the staff saw it, and although if any of you saw the way they were behaving, you probably would agree with me, but it didn't, it didn't do any good. Okay? It scared the staff, um, it wasn't professional, um, the situation didn't get taken away, and now everybody's negative. Okay, including myself, and I had negative feelings and I got my blood pressure up over what? Because some guy didn't know that drinking 15 beers in four hours is not a good idea. Okay. So again, I just think these effects are very interesting. Um, I think 
everything we do, say, feel, not only does that apply to us as the leaders, because if we're up here, we're better. If we get down here, distressed, angry, if we're feeling shameful, if we make a mistake, or if we get down here, our productivity goes bad. And then it affects everybody else. Okay? So I find it very, very interesting information. Okay? Uh, understanding informs your actions. So um, a minute ago I talked about reacting. Um, and I use myself as an example. Again, because I moved from Chicago, I was 18 years old, I chose at 20 years old that I was gonna stop going to college for, after two years and I was gonna go be a golf professional. I didn't have many choices. My choices were be successful in this industry or go back to the drawing board. And I hate school, I hated school. So I was not going to fail. And so I was very passionate about what I was doing. And I was so passionate to a fault that I was, again, very reactive. Okay? I didn't collect all the data before I made decisions a lot of times. I would just take it for what it is, bam, make a decision. Sometimes I was right, a lot of times I was wrong, and then I would have to deal with the aftermath. Okay? So understanding informs your actions. Facts and opinions, this is a big one. Um, employee issues, guest issues, you know, again, opinions. Guest says the greens suck. Uh, one guy comes in the golf shop and says, the greens are terrible. And then three more people come and say, those are the best greens we've ever played in our life. You know, it, it, opinions. You know, we, we can't make our decisions based on, based on opinions. We have to, as the leaders, we have to collect the facts and make decisions off facts, never off opinions, which I've, which I've learned. Um, shame reinforces dominance. So, you know, um, there's one phrase we use, is spiking the football. So if somebody's wrong, if an employee makes a mistake, or if a guest does something they're not proud of, or let's say the person forgets to book their tea time, and they come in, and we've had that circumstance, uh, a local guest will come in, and he's a lawyer in town, he has some clients, and he's coming in the golf shop, and he's kind of one of the guys that we always take care of. He's, you know, we don't have members of the club, but we know when Mr. Smith is coming, we roll up the red carpet, we go out there, we treat it like a private club, because that's what he likes. That's his definition of a good experience. Well, this one day in particular, he comes up, he rolls in, it's big old Bentley, and he's coming in, and he's got his people getting out, and the guest service team starts radioing, Mr. Smith's here, and everyone goes, oh shit. Okay. We have a tournament that day, and we're sold out. So if he's showing up, that means that he either A, forgot to book his tea time, or made an assumption that we have tea times available. Okay. He comes in the golf shop, and we've got a situation. So shame, he's going to feel shameful because he's going to be embarrassed. So we can deal with it one of two ways. And I call it spike in the football because we could throw it in his face like, Mr. Smith, obviously you didn't call. Um, you, we don't have, we're closed today. You know, in my opinion, that's spiking the football in front of his face and saying, you made a mistake. Sorry. Deal with it. Okay? Or if an employee makes a mistake, same thing. You know, you're an idiot. Or you did this, this, and this, and hammered something over it. You know, again, that's not going to do anything. That's spiking the football in front of their face. What's the point of creating shame in someone? Most times, people don't do it on purpose. Mr. Smith didn't do it on purpose. Maybe he, there was a miscommunication. Maybe we made a mistake. Um, and associates, a lot of times, if they're still in your organization, if they make a mistake, it's probably not on purpose. They're probably doing the best they can. So why would we create shame? You know? uh, so again, how we deal with it and how much information we have is going to be the difference between how they react and how they feel. Uh, bullies trying to shame those who threaten their agenda. Similar circumstance of, of those two examples. Bullies uh, fear, shame, take extreme measures to avoid it. So, you know, uh, you know that same example with Mr. Smith, he was going to feel shame, and he didn't want to feel that shame in front of his customers, so he's going to lash out at the golf shop staff, which he did. It was our fault. We screwed up. We didn't tell him. He had a tea time. Ba 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 ba. In my opinion, I don't think we made a mistake there. But again, he's going to lash out because most people, when they feel shame, some people, it's kind of 50-50, when they feel shame, they're going to either lash out at others or they're going to go into a hole. Okay? you got to know what kind of person those are. You know what type of people those are. Um, customers, members, and staff alike. Shame produces only a, couple, only a couple behaviors. And again, one is full attack mode. Got to deal with that, or it's I'm going to go into a I'm going to go into a hole. Um, I made a mistake. 
they beat up on me, I'm no good, I'm terrible, and then their productivity again goes in the toilet. It doesn't help anybody. Okay? They feel bad about themselves, they don't want to come to work the next day. It's, it's no good. Okay? Um, increased exposure equals amplified shame. Um, this would be the example of pulling someone out of the operation if they make a mistake, get them out there, get them in your office, talk to someone. Same thing with guests. If someone's having that guy's having a meltdown in the golf shop, um, I've been in the other golf shops or other businesses where people were going head to head with customers, and you're kind of like, whoa, <laughs> what's going on here? You know, get them out of that arena um, because the less people they have, the less of an audience they have, the more they'll tone it down. Okay, the more they'll tone it down. It's like a dog. If you put a dog in a dog park and there's a lot of dogs, there's going to be a lot of barking, and he's got his teeth out, and he's kind of going at all the dogs. He wants to show everybody what's going on. Same thing, I've, I found, when people get going, if you take them out of that situation, they're gonna calm down because it's one-on-one -on -one scenario that's a lot easier to deal with. Um, and it will give you the best chance to avoid shame altogether. Yeah. Uh, minimize the access to bullies. Um, so someone's having a meltdown, an employee's having a meltdown, get them out of there so the rest of the associates don't have to see it. Uh, do not respond in kind, don't puff out your chest, don't try to show them that you're smarter or that you're right or that we're right and you're wrong type thing. Even with associates, it's just not worth it. Um, same thing, you know, I stood in the staging area three days ago and had a debate with a guest service guy over the HR and 30 minute lunch periods. Um, and it got to the point where he was, he was right and I wasn't changing and I just said, well, Johnny, um, I appreciate your opinion, um, but you know the company's taking a stance on how we're going to deal with 30-minute lunch periods, and I uh, hope you can appreciate that um, and enjoy the rest of your shift. That was it, um, and that was kind of me saying this is the way it is, and if you don't like it, you know you got two choices. I'm not forcing you to work here, but all I'm asking you to do is eat a sandwich, man. <laughs> Come on, <laughs> seriously, what is the problem? Uh, so not going to respond to it. It's just not worth it. Um, my peace of mind, personally, and, I, and we talk about this a lot of time with the leadership team, the quality of my life is much more important to me than getting riled up. You know, I don't need to prove to anybody anything. Um, I don't want to engage someone in negativity. My job is to reduce the negativity, not add to it, because a lot of times when you pile on the negativity, the number one person you hurt is yourself. And I'm not willing to do that. And I learned that through trial and error that um, my stress level was very well uh, mimicked uh, the way that I was dealing with different situations. Use facts and structure as currency. Um, same thing, you can use that. Anytime you have the actual facts, whether it's law or uh, anything else, it's an easy way. A lot of times with ownership, um, that's how we deal with things. Uh, Rob and I work for the same company. so. Uh, you know, facts, uh, it's currency. Because if I need something, if I need a piece of equipment, I could go, hey, I need this piece of equipment. And they're gonna say, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and we're not gonna get anything. But if I have all the facts to prove that this is the best decision for the organization, um, I have a better chance. Uh, and then I can present that to them in a professional way um, and show them that, yes, we need this, this mower because we're bleeding money here and da, ba, 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 ba. And then they can make a decision if they, if they like to. Uh, but those facts are currency, same thing with associates um, or group contacts or anything like that. If I can prove that if you have your event at Sandpiper versus a competitive course in Ventura and you have a charity, we are going to make more money. Let me show you the other charity events that have been held here and let me tell you why. You know, and show them a little statistics. You know, uh, it can be very, very helpful. Um, Another good quote, build your shame tolerating muscles, acknowledge your feelings, then nudge them back in line with deep breathing, other relaxation exercises to calm your brain faster. So, out of this group, how many of you honestly know or have a trigger where you know when your blood pressure is going up? Okay. Does anybody want to share what that is? Your wife. Your wife? In general? That's your trigger? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I can help you with that one. Um, does anybody want to share what it is? What, what, how do you feel? I guess for me, well, it's a, people that are inconsiderate in general. Okay. And I feel just angry. Okay. What, do you have a, a physical feeling?
feeling that you know when your blood pressure's going up? Uh, headaches. Headaches? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? Physical ailments when they feel their blood pressure going up? Just tension in the neck and shoulders. You know, just that. Yeah. Right there. Yeah. Well, again, I, I agree with you. I've had that. I've had the headaches. Um, because, again, my, with my personality, it's full throttle all the time. It's 100%. I'm in, I'm out. Okay, and when having that type of personality, I didn't realize it at a younger age what my personality was. But when I started to do some due diligence out of my personality and understand myself, I could understand the um, the triggers that I have, what triggers those emotions, and how I actually feel. So I can do this. So when something's happening, when there's a difficult situation, when there's a crazy deadline, a negative situation crazy HR problem that's going to take a lot of emotional, um, it's going to take a lot of time or a lot of emotion. I kind of know what those feelings are now. I'm aware of them and I'm able to push them back down. Not let them control the decisions, but be aware of it, understand it, accept it, and move on. So I think that this shame tolerating muscle uh, uh, quote, you know, when you're a leader of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people, um, at some point you're going to have to deal with your own emotions. So I feel that, uh, that that's an interesting point. Okay. Um, conflict. Conflict is something that most people think is negative. Um, it can be, but it can also be positive. So there's two types of conflict. Cognitive is around ideas or constructive. So sitting in a room, brainstorming session, whiteboard, all right, what's the problem? We need to drive tournament rounds. What are we going to do? Okay. That is conflict. Okay. How, are we, how are we creating that? Uh, the effective is uh, conflict is, is around emotion, so that's dysfunctional. Okay. So negative conflict is what we're trying to avoid. That's what this whole presentation is about. That's the things that, the ideas that I'm trying to share with you, is that if we lead um, with emotion, and making decisions based on rea a reactive nature, it's going to be very difficult to control conflict, okay? Because we add to it. We keep making it worse, throwing gasoline on the fire. Um, and that's what we're trying to avoid. So it's critical to see competing values and to identify tension and conflicts, okay? We have to do that. We're the leaders. We're in charge. There's no one else, okay? If we don't see it for our people, and we don't lead the team in the right direction, we're sunk. Because it's our job to do that. That's what the leader does. Doesn't make it worse, it finds the way to make it better. Okay? No conflict, no change. Conflict can be expanded from the trivial to the extreme. I think we can all agree on that. It could be like, hey Johnny, you didn't shave today. You know, you've got 15 minutes to get back to your house and shave and come back to work. You know, it can be that, or it can be, you know, someone you know drove a car off a cliff and it destroyed it, and someone could be hurt. You know, that's, that would be a much different situation. Tough times equals tough conflict, layoffs, okay? scaling down the business. Um, those are some serious decisions. Um, tough times that we've been going through that our industry might be continuing to head into, that's going to lead to more and more conflict. So again, we need to build our muscles, uh, how we deal with conflict so we can handle it, so we don't get to the point where the job is unbearable and we don't like what we're doing. The more difficult the conflict, the more hypervigilant the outsider, stronger the negative emotions and danger, the more primitive the coping devices. This goes back to the innate effects. And again, the more things get crazy, the more people revert back to basic human nature. Okay? And we have to understand that when people feel threatened or feared or scared of their job or whatever it is, um, they do a lot of crazy things. And again, it goes back to the innate affects of people. So we have to understand that. The more it is, the more negative the situation or the conflict, the more we have to be on top of our game. The more we have to be ahead of it to prevent it. Okay? Many naturally avoid conflict because of the fear of feelings. Uh, that's an interesting one. Um, if you can't, if you're afraid of conflict, in my opinion, it's not a good idea to be a leader because that's what you do every day. Right? I mean, for those of us that manage people, we're firemen, right? We're putting out fires all day, every day. What's this problem? What's that? What's broken? What's this? How are we going to do that? What's that? What's the problem? Why are the financials here? We're dealing with conflict all the time. So if we're trying to run away from it, it's just not the right job for us. 
Um, so, and we have to also know, um, I've seen some apprentices or some young assistants that have this problem, and we talk about this stuff, and I explain these type of things and say, hey, from my experience, and from the experience of the other leadership team, this is something you're gonna be dealing with for the next 30, 40 years. So if you hate it, or if it's not right for you, we need to find a different area, okay? Because this is what we do. You know, that's what these leaders do. When you're running a business, we deal with conflict all day, every day, and we have to be, we have to be very good at it, okay? So just a couple uh, checklist items. Uh, we're getting through here pretty good. Find the conflict. Decide the outcome you prefer. That's a, that's a good one. Um, decide before. Follow it. Follow the reality. Tolerate the negative feelings. And solve the right issues only. Okay? So this is just a little checklist that we put together. Uh, we have a couple things above our desks. This is one thing that we, we talk about a lot. Is when we have situations, positive or negative, this is the biggest one. We want to decide what we want first. And then we're going to design our plan after that. What are we looking to achieve? What's the outcome we prefer? Okay? And then everything we do, everything we say, every move we make, every minute we're at the office or at the golf course, that's what we're doing. Okay? Uh, because we understand that. I don't think, if you, if you don't understand this, uh, none of this matters because you're going to be just kind of floating in, in, uh, in space. Okay? Follow the reality. You know, sometimes things aren't perfect. Uh, we can't get to everything anymore. Uh, we have 50... 14 people on our maintenance crew, okay? And we have 214 acres. Um, we can't do everything all the time. We have to solve the right issues, and we have to deal with the best we can. We have to be able, you know, aware of what affects the guest experience directly. What do the guests see, and what do I see? What does the superintendent think he sees, and what do the guests see? And we have to understand, so that goes to the right issues. And again, tolerating the negative feelings, that's a lot of what I just talked about. Our ability to tolerate them, understand them, develop them, and help other people dealing with them, that's how our leadership qualities will, will start to improve. Right. All right, judgment, just a little diagram here. Collect the relevant data, boil down to essence, and act. Okay, pretty, pretty simple, kind of sums up everything we're talking about here. Uh, found, it, found it very helpful. Uh, so a couple of lessons. Let's kind of sum everything up. Lead with character, build trust, um, informal authority, be a source of inspiration, radiate integrity. You know, if you're going and you know, uh, this actually happened to me. Won't name any names, but when I applied at Sandpiper, uh, I was 18 years old and I worked at this club in Chicago called Bobolink, and it was a very buttoned-up club. Okay, and so I came from there and I was moving to California, and I was used to the Chicago go go go, and I came to California and everyone's like, oh. You know, I'll do it later, or maybe tomorrow, or whatever it was. So I went to the job interview, and Sam Piper had a different ownership at the time, and I'm dressed like this. I'm in a suit, I've got resumes, I've got the whole deal, I had letters from the, from the head golf professional, and I'm, you know, serious as a heart attack. And I go in the back, and the place is a disaster in the golf shop, first of all. There's golf shirts pinned to the wall, and I was used to things a little bit more, you know, merchandise, and I'm kind of going, whoa, this is, you know, the ocean's right there, and this is the first time I've seen mountains in my life, but this is, this is weird. And I go in the back office and the head professional at the time has a glass of scotch on the counter and he has kind of feet kicked up. We're talking, he's looking, he goes, yeah, I'd love to hire you. He goes, you do need to take a drug test. Um, you need a few days? He goes, I went to Chico State and I've done it all. He goes, I've done this, I've done that. And I'm looking at him like, seriously? This is how it goes? So I was, again, back to Radington. I never took him seriously from that point forward. So within 20 minutes of meeting the guy, I was going, wow, <laughs> this guy, I, I, I don't know if I can work here, first of all. And second of all, you know, I'm going to do what I think is right when it comes to doing my job because I've been trained for five years at a private club. So I'm going to do what I know to do because obviously this guy has a few issues. Okay? So I always think of that story when I get that. Foster inclusion and lead for the benefit of the whole champion professional responsibility and community engagement. Um, that's been a really fun part, community engagement. Um, recently, uh, last year, I, um, I, I got on the board of the American Red Cross um, for the Central Coast, which has been great. Uh, it's been great for business. It's been great for me personally. It's been great for the assistants and some of the staff that we can get involved and, and, and 
do different things. So I think being in the community, um, I didn't do it for a while because I was so busy and I didn't have time and, and all these different things. Um, but it's been really rewarding. So we, we try and talk about get out in the community doing different things. Understand and be realistic about the work landscape and the footing. Be flexible of mind. We have no choice there. <laughs> it just kind of is what it is. The work landscape is what it is. Uh, I know golf professionals back in Chicago when I was growing up were making 400 k Own the golf shop, making a killing. Rolexes, Mercedes, the whole deal. Big house. Oh, we're going to the pro's house. Some big mansion in Lake Forest, Illinois. <laughs> I don't know a lot. When those jobs go away, when those guys retire, it's not worth 400 k anymore. Okay? Members own the, uh, the golf shop now, and it's just a little bit different. So I think we have to be realistic about it, um, deal with it, and be flexible in mind. And if we enjoy what we're doing and we love golf and we love being leaders, then um, that's our choice, and we just have to accept it. Identify the feelings. Remember the calm is a breach of the strong. Seek emotional and psychological uh, stability. I always think of, um, um, I always think of, uh, what's the movie? Uh, the Italian movie with uh, the mob movie. Uh, the, uh, the, God, the Godfather. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. My father would be so disappointed. Uh, the Godfather. You know, Michael, you got Michael, then you got his brother. His brother, sunny, crazy, <clears throat> flight off the handle, emotional, reactive, and he ends up with 500 bullet holes in him, Swiss cheese on the side of the freeway. Okay? Michael, calm, you know, don't talk to anybody outside the family, stoic. He's the one that. that uh, led the family for a while until he bought the farm. Okay? So um, remember that comes the virtue of the strong. Um, I've seen it both ways. I think there's a lot of different uh, leaders, CEOs, uh, coaches, all these different people that we can look to uh, to kind of understand how they lead people. But most of them, you know, again, they're calm. They make good decisions. Those are the ones that, uh, that have a long career uh, of being uh, successful leaders. Okay? Take the necessary time to reflect and think, build brain speed, employ ready, aim, fire, but know the seduction of ready, fire, aim. Master the judgment triangle, again, that's just the same thing. Uh, talking about reactive and, as opposed to collecting data. Learn from the past and embrace the future with a realistic eye. Um, and uh, those are just kind of the sum ups here. Um, a couple last two things here. These are just things that I, I thought I'd share. The Working Alliance, I thought, is really interesting because if you don't have this alliance component, I feel like you can't really focus on the big wins in an organization if you don't have this alliance component with your leadership team, at least the top layer of management. If you don't have this alliance component, you can't go to the next step. You're always going to be stuck shooting for the blocking tackle. You know, you're going to be always shooting for the small things, but it's going to be really hard to put the team together to go do something big. For example, build a new golf course, or you know, set the bar on different things, or put the budget together as a team. It's going to be really hard to do if you don't have goals, mutually endorsed and valued, so everybody doesn't agree, tasks to reflect the behaviors of both parties and perceived as relevant in each. <laughs> There's, we do an action list as well for each department. And I've done plenty of action lists over the years where they're looking at me and I'm looking at them and I think it's the best action list in the world and I think we can get it done in 30 days. And they're giving me a look like, first of all, are you nuts? Second of all, I don't think we should be doing this. Um, so we stopped a long time ago of DJ creating the action list and doling it out and saying, this is what we're doing this month. It become, all right. Let's write everything up on the board. What are all the issues we have department by department? And let's decide together on what are the most critical things. And then sometimes I'll steer it kind of where I want it to go. But for the most case, they know. So once we all accept it, then it's done. And it's done fast. And it's done much better than forcing it. Bonds, positive attachments, including trust. This is the biggest one. I say this to every single associate that works at any of our properties. The minute we have the trust, the minute I, we don't have trust between us is the day our relationship ends, period. That's it. There's no negotiation. There's no talking. There's no forms. There's no write-ups. Game over. You lie. You cheat. You steal from the company. You're gone. That day, no questions asked. I think it's a very tough landscape. 
Um, and I'm only 32 years old, but being at Sandpiper for 14 years with as many hundreds and hundreds of employees I've been, I had the opportunity to work with, I've seen my fair share of trust issues, and we've determined in the last five years that we don't accept it, period. That is the biggest thing to us, is trust. We ha they have to trust the employees, whether it's a maintenance crew guy that's worked there for four years, he has to trust that every single day I come to work trying to make sure he keeps his job, we drive business, and I'm doing everything I can to make sure he has a happy and safe workplace. If they don't trust me, they're not going to do their job. If the associates don't feel protected, because as the general manager of two golf courses, I feel like my responsibility is the protector. I shield them from problems. I shield them from the ownership. I shield them from negative experiences. I shield them from the uh, negative write-ups on the internet. I deal with that all. I don't want them to get involved in that. Okay? So that's where this really builds. When they know that I'm, a, as the leader of the operation, I'm their ally, I'm their asset, not the enemy, that's when things really take a whole new relationship. And it becomes a lot more fun. Um, and I really didn't understand that early in my career. I assumed that they knew that I was waking up every day and doing everything for them, but I, they didn't know uh, because I didn't find creative ways to show them or to tell them or engage them. Okay? And then a spirit of collaboration. Okay? So just interesting thing. Um, again, I believe that this is an ebb and flow. Um, sometimes you have it, sometimes you don't, based on, based on who you have on the team and all these different things. This is the last thing which I'll let you uh, take a look at. I'm just going to click through it so we can get everyone on the road. Um, but this is a great thing, uh, a great little chart. Changing managerial functions. This is top management, middle management, first line, and top management. We used to have this, 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 and this. Now we have this, some, one or two of these, and this. This is completely gone, and this is almost eroded. The biggest problem we're going to have in our industry my opinion and the opinion of our team is that the erosion of this model and whenever somebody is dipping down on a daily basis things start to slip so the top management should be conceptual uh, understanding history macro issues literally no feedback problem anticipator but if they're down here all the time if they're constantly jumping back the company can't move forward if the company doesn't move forward we don't drive the revenue if we don't drive the revenue we can't afford the first line supervisors, and it's a vicious cycle. So irregardless of who we have or who people have in their organization, whatever business, people have to stay in their realms, okay? We can't have these guest service guys telling me how we're gonna do HR, <laughs> and we can't have me going and doing, uh, washing clubs, although i really like to. Um, <laughs> I can't do it because if I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that my job. If I'm not my, doing my job, we get stuck in the cycle. So again, I won't get too into this, but take the time to read this. I thought this was very interesting because 80 to 36 employees, things have to shrink. People start doing different things. And as the leaders, we're the ones that delegate responsibility. We control everything that happens, every decision, every outcome, the quality of people's lives, the quality of the guest experience. So we control this. And every decision we make, we can keep people in, our, in their rows if we're smart about it, if we plan, if we take that Abe Lincoln approach, it can happen. There's a lot of different models and a lot of different businesses and industries that have been shrunken down. They were able to be successful. Golf is going through it now. So I'm extremely happy to be here to have the opportunity to talk to everybody. I hope some of this stuff was helpful to you. I know some of it's kind of out of bounds um, for golf professionals. Um, I didn't see any of this in my PGA work when I was doing it, but I hope as a group we can get together and talk about these things more often because this is the way it's going. And if we want to be the leaders and we want the PGA golf professional wants to be the top of the totem pole at golf facilities and not the CMA and superintendent, associate, or whatever, if we want to be the decision makers, the ones that control our own jobs and the destiny of the assistants and the apprentices, we have to be the best. We have to be the best leaders. We have to be trusted the most by our owners and our members and the golfing the golf industry. And if we learn and we band together, and I think if we continue to talk about these things, and you all can tell me and everyone else your ideas and how you do this, we will succeed. 
If we continue on the path like we've always done it, we're going to get overrun. And that would be sad because the PGA golf professional should be at the top of the totem pole of this industry at all times until the end of time. So, thank you.